I hear it. They've got a full deal. Committee will come to order. We, uh, we welcome the House over to this side. We welcome those of you who have come today to um, make presentations to us and those of you who have come both to listen and to give your written testimony. Um, senators and legislators, there are copies of testimonies of people who won't be here, who aren't here today. Um, and, and so they sent their testimonies ahead, and so that's in your folders and there with your information. Um, as you're all aware, today is the presentation on suction dredge mining. And uh, we have four people who are going to present, and then after they're done, we have to be out of here at 2.30. So um, any time left from those four, there's some of you that have signed up here, and we'll try to hear from you too in, th in that amount of time if we can get through that, that quickly. So with that, we'd like to start off. Uh, uh, Representative Shepard, anything you would like to add here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd just like to welcome everybody and appreciate the turnout. It's an important issue, and I'm very pleased that we're getting this hearing. And thank the both chairman and thank everybody for coming. Representative uh, Shepard said act, he acted to me like there'd be three or four of you here. <laughs> We'd like to start off first with Joe Green. He's a U.S. EPA scientist. He'll, uh, he'll first speak to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman uh, Pierce and Chairman Denny and all the members of the committee. I thank you very much for being here today so that we can share this important information with you. As the Senator said, I am a retired research biologist from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. I've been a lifelong environmentalist, and I've also been a small-scale gold suction dredger for over 30 years. I was an invited member of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife Environmental Impact Report Public Advisory Committee because they recognized my expertise in both fields. Now, there have been a number of important studies that have concluded that small-scale gold suction dredging impact on the environment is less than significant. And report after report, that term arises, less than significant. I first saw that in 1992 in a publication of Chugach National Forest in Alaska. It was repeated in 1994 by the California Department of Fish and Game in their first environmental impact report. In 2001, the Siskiyou National Forest reported the same. And in the year 2000, US EPA funded a research project on 40 Mile River, Alaska, where they studied the performance of 10, 8, and 4-inch dredges. And they concluded that the environmental impact from these, these operations, even the largest operations, were less than significant. In 2003, Peter Bailey, professor at Oregon State University, was hired by Siskiyou National Forest, he did the study on suction dredging and found it was less than significant. And in 2004, we got to Idaho, and the Clearwater National Forest published an environmental impact report. In 2012, Wallawa Whitman in Oregon published a report. And so important in 19, or excuse me, 2012, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife published a $1.5 million environmental impact report that was court ordered because the environmentalists had sued the state. The conclusion of that study was that the impact of small scale gold suction dredging on the environment was less than significant. If you're hearing anything about suction dredging, you will hear and it's a fact that suction dredging in the state of California is illegal. It's been shut down. So the science didn't mean a thing. When they found they couldn't shut it down based on science, they used their political clout. They had a friendly senator attach a bill that would close mining to a trailer budget bill, uh, one of those must-pass bills in the last week or two of the legislature. And that's exactly how that mining was closed. 
So you can see that with all this available literature, we are not working in an information vacuum, as some people might lead you to believe. Turbidity, that's that plume behind the dredge. This is the Environmental Protection Agency and environmentalists are concerned about that. Turbidity is not a pollutant. Turbidity is a measure of how clear the water is, but it's a surrogate measurement for suspended solids in solution. Now as an example, there was one study that found when upstream of suction dredge, the turbidity, uh, I, I need to explain this, Turbidity is reported as nephilometric turbidity unit, NTU. So this study found less than one NTU upstream of the operating dredge. 16 feet downstream, they found 50 NTU. And on average during the day, it was running at about five. So what does that mean? In a controlled laboratory experiment env environment where fish were continuously exposed to turbidity ranges from 21 to 62,000 NTU, it was found that it would require continuous 24 hour per day exposure to cause lethal effects. For example, 21 uh, NTU of exposure, the fish would survive for 11 months before perishing. At 57 NTU, they survived for four months. At 254 NTU, they would survive for seven weeks. Research has found that the duration of exposure plays a more dominant role on the effects of fish than the total suspended solids concentration. In a California environmental impact report survey, they found the average time that a small-scale gold suction dredge operated was 5.6 hours per day. The remaining time was spent working on equipment and processing materials. Also, there's effect of scale. Whoops, sorry. Okay. I don't know why I'm having trouble. Okay. The effect of scale. The effect of scale is always ignored by environmentalists. And as you've le you would, will, will be led to believe that vast expanses of Idaho waterways will be destroyed. Some statistics from the western states are this. The percentage of land area within riparian zones, in this case Siskiyou National Forest, occupied mining claims is estimated to be 0.01%. Total acreage of all analyzed claims related to the total acres of watershed was 0.02%. The amount of sediment moved by suction dredges was equal to about 0.2% of the winter natural movement of sediments. Suction dredge impact on the Salmon River, California was less than 0.26%. I don't know why it's not going the right way. Is there another one? Okay. This is interesting because that dredge, if you look on this satellite photograph, that little spot in front of the arrow is that dredge. We're talking about effective scale. There's not another dredge in sight from that one dredge. Okay, I wanted to further refine some data. The Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board, on an assumption that there were 200 suction dredge miners operating in Oregon waters during the in-water work period, which is approximately three months, this resulted in an estimated effect on Oregon waterways of 0.0064% would be impacted. Idaho is estimated to have 193 river miles. A four inch small suction dredge is estimated to work 25 feet of riverbed every 20 days or 75 feet in three months. Using these figures for calculating the impact on Idaho waters we estimated that the 950 permitted miners working under the Idaho Department of Water Resources permit in 2012 will impact approximately 13 miles of Idaho's 193,000 miles, or 0.006% of 
of Idaho's rivers and streams. The number of permits for 2013 dropped by 41% because of the influence and concerns over the EPA permit. Uh, I don't want to know why I'm going in circles. There we go. Beneficial effects. Small-scale gold suction dredging improves water quality by removing massive amounts of garbage. What you're seeing in this one wow. photograph was removed from one claim in one year from the American River in California. That is not mining waste. Golf balls, oars, you really can't see, just loaded with sunglasses and those little visors that go around your head, but they don't. So uh, this is one thing that miners do. And if we don't clean that up off, off our claims, who do you think is going to get blamed for it? The owner of the claim, yes. Fish survival is improved under turbid conditions. Also, the holes and depressions deeper than three feet create safe habitat for fish. The predatory birds can't get down there and they can get down from the other birds. Dredging breaks up compacted stream beds and dredged tailings may be composed of a portion of the suitable spawning gravels each year. Dredge tailings protect established reds by offering additional spawning substrate. <clears throat> the, EP, let's see, the implementation of the Idaho NPDES permit for small scale gold suction dredging is a classic example of mission creep, where a body of permanent bureaucrats unanswerable to the public change the intent of Congress. The U.S. has been harmed by the many laws whose justification is based on a totally unscientific hoax. At this point, control of the nation's water quality should be returned in full to the states. The United States Environmental Protection Agency, as authorized under the Clean Water Act and the NPDES permit program, controls water pollution. There's no question about that. But by regulating point sources, that discharge pollutants in two waters of the in two waters of the United States, and into is a key phrase here. Point sources are discrete conveyances such as pipes and man-made dishes. The addition of a pollutant into a water system is key to whether or not the EPA has regulatory jurisdiction over specific mining activity. The United States Supreme Court has twice ruled that the transfer of polluted water between two parts of the same body of water do not constitute, uh, constitute a discharge of pollutants under the Clean Water Act. The court went on to say the movement of pollution within the same body of water does not fall under the Clean Water Act because there is no addition of pollutants. Small-scale gold suction dredges operating in the rivers and streams of Idaho are working within the normal high water mark of a river channel and they cannot add pollution to the system. In fact, they only remediate through the removal of gold, rarely mercury, iron, steel, and all this waste that I've just shown you. Miners say that they're fed up with the threats. That is actually a headline of a news article that I've included in the packet that I gave you. I'm not going to waste a lot of time on that because I want to state here that John Cross received a letter from the Environmental Protection Agency threatening the small-scale suction dredger with a minimum fine of $37,500. Furthermore, the region went on and threatened him with up to three years in jail and another fine of $50,000 if he didn't get his dredge out of the water. So what I did is I added a page back here for all of you that lists all of the fines that they can put on a miner under the NPDES permit. And you'll see that it ranges from $2,500 to $2 million. It's clear that the Clean Water Act and the NPDES permit was never written for this small scale industry. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Green. Appreciate it. Can you hear me? We'll, we'll turn over to Tom Kitchar now. Go ahead. Right.
State your name and who you represent, and yeah. welcome to the committee. Thank you. My name is Tom Kitcher. I'm president of the Waldo Mining District based out of southwestern Oregon. We were established in 1852, seven years before Oregon became a state. Uh, at that time, we were the only government in southern Oregon, and I like to tell people at that time, we could hang people. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the Chairman Pierce and Denny and the members of the committee. We in Oregon have been fighting with the EPA through our Department of Environmental Quality since 2005. We have been actively seeking to get rid of the MPDS portion of our permit in court for eight years now. We are still in the middle of that process. Uh, I've learned a lot. I want to talk to you today a little bit about what I have found out about the Clean Water Act and what it was supposed to do and the way it's been misinterpreted to suction dredge mining in particular. Let's see if I can get the button to work here for me. Is this the one we were using? Yeah. Down. Ah, okay, the Clean Water Act generally requires a permit for any discharge or addition of a pollutant into waters of the United States. The important word here, actually there's three of them, is addition, pollutant, and waters of the United States. You notice it doesn't say waters of the state of Idaho or waters of the state of Oregon or California. It says waters of the United States. The Clean Water Act contains two primary permitting schemes. There's what they call a Section 404, which is under the jurisdiction of the Army Corps of Engineers for the discharge of dredge or fill material. These type of operations would be your typical large-scale bucket dredge used for clearing navigational channels in some of the larger rivers, harbors, uh, excavations in a water to maybe sink pilings for uh, a pier or something like that. And there's section 402, which is under the jurisdiction of the EPA, for all other discharges that aren't covered by 404. So another way to look at this is the 404 permit is the exemption for 402 under the Clean Water Act. The courts have ruled that each of these permit schemes are mutually exclusive of the other. Under the Clean Water Act, a single discharge into waters of the United States requires either a 404 permit or a 402 permit, but not both. And it's kind of interesting that our latest round of lawsuits against Oregon in 2009, the Oregon Court of Appeals ruled we needed both. Totally ignored a June 2009 U.S. Supreme Court ruling that concluded if you're under 404, you do not need a 402. And what that court decided was that the suspended materials were not dredged material. They magically became pollutant and therefore fall under 402. Of course, we argued that the dredge doesn't make any silt. The suspended little fine little particles that stay in suspension in the water that create the turbidity are already present in the stream bed sediment. All we're doing is sucking it up, passing it through the dredge, and putting it back in the water where it came from. We don't change it one bit, except for the little bit that we recover in the sluice box. We don't grind the rocks up. We don't make any more small particles. Nothing. The court totally ignored that. So we're still in court. Section 404, as I mentioned, permits such activities, navigational dredging, in water construction, and discharges that act as fill. You can actually take materials from onshore, take them to water, and dump them in, like fill in a wetlands. That's fill material. It'd be under 404. There is one exception to 404, which is incidental fallback, which normally would be if you took a shovel and stuck it into two feet of water and 
got a shovel full of sediment, and as you lift that shovel up out of the, through the water column, a certain amount of that material is going to wash off of the shovel. That's generally the idea of incidental fallback. Now here's section 402 is what the problem here today is about. MPDS permits are required for any discharge addition of a pollutant from a point source into waters of the United States. Okay, the courts have ruled that all five of those factors must be present for an MPDS permit to apply. The U.S. Supreme Court has ruled that addition means materials from the outside world going into the water. So if it was already in the water and you're just putting it back in the same water, there is no addition. There was a case down in Florida, South Florida, uh, yeah, water management district against the Mikoski Indian tribe, whatever. Sandra Day O'Connor gave a perfect analogy of what addition means. And she basically said, if you have a pot of soup and you take a ladle full of soup and lift it above the pot and then pour it back into the soup, you've added nothing to the soup. It's almost exactly what a suction dredge does. Suction dredges do not add pollutants, but instead we safely remove most heavy pollutants already in the water at no cost to the public. Mr. Green showed a slide with a lot of trash and garbage that was cleaned up out of a claim down in California. This year we have a record, it was put up on Facebook, of some miners on the Umpqua River, which is kind of in central western Oregon. And I don't remember, it was for over 400 pounds of lead from fishing were recovered in less than a week. And the picture is, I wish I had it, but it's fantastic. It shows a typical uh, park type picnic table and you really can't even see the picnic table. They put all this lead that they gathered and just piled it on the picnic table until you can't even see it anymore. So we do recover a lot in places, especially where fishing is popular and I'm not trying to, I'm from Minnesota originally, I like to fish just as much as the next guy, but it always puzzled me, why do they get to throw lead in the water and we're not allowed to remove it? <laughs> Section 402 only applies to waters of the United States, which are defined by the EPA as the navigable waters at the time of statehood. I mentioned this more in my test, written testimony that I believe you've all got a copy of in more detail. I did not go heavily into this issue of navigable waters, but as the legislature of the state of Idaho, you may want to. The reason I didn't go into it is because there are multiple court decisions that the whole issue is highly confusing. The federal government is pretending as though all waters in the states, not just Idaho, belong to them. So I asked the question, are all waters in Idaho waters of the United States, or are they waters of the state of Idaho? Now the Army Corps has a different definition for, now, or for waters of the United States. I didn't include it either because it takes about three pages, and it deals with the Commerce Act, uh, interstate commerce, international commerce, things like that. It's mostly for transportation purposes. Uh, many of the smaller streams that we mine in, nobody's floating. The, the, the dredge won't even float until you move rocks out of the way. The water isn't deep enough. There is no transport. These aren't navigable by any you know, normal meaning of the word. Then we have the congressional intent of the Clean Water Act. This came from uh, I believe 1977, Senator Muskie at the time might have been, at least he was heavily involved with it, and the, the quote from him is, the bill tries to free from the threat of regulation those kinds of man-made activities which are sufficiently de minimis as to merit general attention at the state and local level and little or no attention at the national level. So here we have one or two 
little suction dredge miners that are just minding their own business and want to go out and supplement their income, maybe even their, maybe their, maybe it's their primary source of income. They're relatively insignificant what we're doing. The Army Corps for years refuses to permit us because they've already ruled us as de minimis. They say a four inch dredge and smaller is totally de minimis and does not need permitting by them just because it's a waste of everybody's time. This might help this body, this legislative body, in that in the Clean Water Act under 33 U.S.C. 1370, I'm going to just jump past this. It just says, as except as expressly provided in the chapter, nothing in this chapter shall, one, preclude or deny the right of any state to uh, adopt or enforce any standard or limitation respecting discharges of pollutants. The more important one is this number two, be construed as impairing or in any manner affecting any right or jurisdiction of the states with respect to the waters, including boundary waters, of such states. So even under the Clean Water Act, they recognize that the actual control of these waters should be under the state. The state can come up with its own whatever limitation or regulation is required to make sure that there is no significant harm being occurring to the environment. It does not need the federal agency from Seattle coming in here with their, as we've seen up in Alaska recently, jackbooted thugs uh, in SWAT uniforms to worry about somebody getting the water a little muddy. Okay, and this is just the last slide, just to give you an idea of the scale. I've got a dredge number 51, which would typically be used to dredge out harbors and navigational channels and, you know, like the Columbia River and some of the larger waterways. And if you notice, sitting next to the bucket, as close to scale as I could get, it represents a four-inch dredge. The whole machine would fit inside that bucket. With one scoop of that bucket is going to move more material than that dredge is going to move in eight hours. And yet, that big dredge operates under 404, not MPDS permitting. And I thank this committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We appreciate you coming. Next, we have uh, Doug Giddings. Doug is the Idaho County Sheriff, and we welcome you to the committee. And Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Doug Giddings, Sheriff of Idaho County for the last five years. <clears throat> and I'm here today to share maybe a couple of situations that have occurred in Idaho County. And I want you to understand these are just my, I guess you'd say my decisions that I make upon these situations that occur. As an elected sheriff, I enforce local and state law. I don't enforce federal law. I'm not required to. I actually couldn't if I wanted to. But my primary focus as a sheriff is to enforce any violation to the citizens of my county where their constitutional rights are violated. That's number one. However, when federal, or I should say, and then when federal agencies start making rules and regulations and they become heavy-handed and I'll say this in a different way when they talk about the fines if you had a traffic violation and we charge you ten thousand dollars that would be really heavy-handed when you put garbage in the wrong dumpster and a federal officer writes you a ticket it's five hundred dollars unless you plead not guilty then it can be one year in federal prison or $10,000. So which do you think you do? Is it, some of the rules just seem arbitrary, and they, in my opinion, the way I was brought up and tend to believe, is they're just arbitrary. There's some man making that rule. The way I was raised is we have elected officials. They elect me. We elect you. You make the rules. We hire people that are answerable to the people. That's the way it's supposed to work. 
the federal agencies, and in this case I'm talking about law enforcement or regulation enforcement, they don't answer to the people. They don't answer to anybody. Well, yes, they do. They answer to the person that they work for. And I've had more than one discussion, usually somewhat adversarial, is that they don't answer to the people. And that's not the way our government's supposed to work, in my opinion. And that causes real stress on the folks that the federal agencies are working with. If you've ever been stopped by a federal law enforcement officer, you will get a quick overview of how it works because I would guess that you don't have any idea how it works right now. I didn't either when I became sheriff, and I've been in law enforcement since I was 25, and I'm 68. That Add that up. That's a long time. You just don't know how it works, and once you're caught in it, you lose. The folks that they hire are usually not local. They come into this area, wherever you are. In my county, I'm referring there is no administrator, for example, EPA. There are no, e I asked somebody out in the hall, have you ever seen an EPA person? Well, of course not. Where are they? Well, maybe there's one here, I don't know. But nobody knows, unless you happen to work with them. But they have, not investigators, but uh, inspectors. So an inspector will come and look at your dredge and what rule does he go by? I don't know. Nobody has a copy of those rules. He'll take pictures, make his report, and then he leaves. You think you're good. You're not, because you're going to get a letter in the mail that you owe X number of dollars if you don't get that dredge out or whatever they decide, whatever that inspector and the person who is his boss, which is in this case Seattle. I'm not sure that the people in Seattle understand the local, I guess you would say, the local process, the local people, their mentality. They don't even understand the local government or the local environment. They're not from, they're not from Boise, although there are some in Boise, but they probably weren't born and raised here. Probably born like the one is from Alaska. You will get an EPA violation in the mail if you so violate. You don't deal with anybody individually. As a sheriff, I stand as the gap between the people that I represent and was elected to represent and the person who is putting the hammer on you or on the individual who was not elected. He doesn't really care what you have to say unless he just personally cares because he doesn't answer to you. He answers to his boss, who answers to his boss, who answers to his boss, none of which are elected officials. There's nobody local to listen to. You may have one if you switch agencies, you go over to BLM or something, then they will have a local person there, but they also don't answer to the people. They answer to their boss. I won't repeat what the gentleman said before about the DEQs, this Department of uh, Environmental Quality. They've done studies. There have been numerous studies done. The EPA blames the U.S. fisheries for the rules that the EPA requires to fill the permit to dredge. I don't know who makes these rules. They weren't that way 10 years ago. Supposedly they used the Clean Water Act from 40 years ago. I don't know who makes these rules, but I don't think you do, and I don't think our senators and congressmen, I don't think they do either. I don't think any elected official because apparently the EPA has the permission to make rules, so they hire somebody who's all-knowing and he makes the rules to make sure that these people are all safe and that their rivers are clear and the birds are safe and the endangered species all live quietly, peacefully in the river. But that's not true in my opinion. I don't think that they use good, um, I guess you'd say analogies or good information because it's kind of like having two psychiatrists in court. One says the guy is crazy, I've tested him, and the other hired by the opposing team says he's not crazy, he's just fine. So science can go either direction. It depends on which side you're on, whether you like it or not. They claim the danger to the river by these dredges. And I say, and I'm not a scientist, and I don't know the dredging rules and environmental rules and all that, but I tell you there's one fire or one blowout, which we have, I would say, at least one, two, three, four every year. 
those will do more damage to the Salmon River or the Clearwater River or any other river than all the dredgers that you could dream up. And it's just, there's no comparison. If you've been on a fire and you see what happens after a fire, if you've seen a blowout, if you uh, have ever been up toward our direction in Idaho County and you see the river and all of a sudden it's just brown, can't see, you can't see it at all. It's, it's absolutely filthy from a blowout. All the dredges in the world can't make that happen. And you know what? There's still salmon in there, and there's still steelhead, and there's still dredgers, and uh, yeah, it's just some bad science they're using to cut the dredgers out, I believe. They claim that it does damage to the fish. It does damage to the bullhead trout. Uh, jet boats do damage, too. That's next. Because when a jet boat screams up the river, causes a wave, and it kicks up dirt that's on the side, it's actually not in the river. It's just some crazy ways they make rules, and I don't think it's really the rule to the science that does it. I think it's an ideology, and when you have a certain belief, you will make rules to match that belief. One of them I got uh, this last week, that one of the reasons they're closing the Salmon River is there's too much mercury in it. The mercury in it is, is natural. It comes out of the ground up the river. There's not too much mercury in it. It's the way it is. In fact, the dredgers take mercury out if they find it. Naturally occurring. Can't change that. The feds and their lawmaking and their law enforcing, they have very poor communication with the people of, in my case, Idaho County. In fact, they don't communicate with them because they're not there. They're behind locked doors uh, or they're in their trucks driving by. They don't communicate. They don't say what's going on. They just enforce these rules, and they have a book of rules that you didn't make, I don't make. I don't even know what they are, um, and that includes not just the EPA. Uh, when I ask for information from the EPA, they send me a whole boatload of stuff telling me why they have the authority to come into my county and inspect and find the dredgers. And so I send them a copy of my book, the ones that you wrote, and tell them what I can do if I catch them in my county. Now, <laughs> that's... I knew I was safe in saying that. I knew it was behind me. <laughs> and I talked to the trooper in the back, just in case. <laughs> I'm going to throw this out, and then I'll be done. Their rules and regulations are not acceptable to, I would say, the majority of people, especially in Idaho County. You may have some bad ideas about Idaho County, but it's awesome. 8,503 square miles of absolute beauty. Tons and tons of water running everywhere. But this is what I believe. When I say they, in this case, I'm talking about the EPA. They want us out of the river because the reasons they use to get us out of the river are not valid. They want us out of the river, so it doesn't matter the excuse. They want us out of the river. And like I said earlier, I think the jet boats are next. And if the fishermen don't quit putting lead in there, the fishermen will be next. They want to control the folks. They want to control their access to the river. And if you don't think that's happening now, it's because you're not ever out on the river. They do control access. This is a good example. It's like, how do you fill a bucket if all you have is a drip? Well, you leave it under the faucet long enough, and that one drip at a time will fill the bucket. And they do one drip at a time in law enforcement, in regulations. They change the regulation on a monthly, yearly, whatever. Regulation's not the same this year as it was last year. They change it. Who changed it? Somebody. It's either a new guy that came in and said, hey, we can change it and keep him out. So their, I guess their wording to us in a very quiet, simple, hushed way is to stay out of the river. It's also stay out of the forest. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but the regulations to stay out of the forest, they close roads. Why do they close roads? To keep you safe. Keep the trees safe. Keep the animals safe. Keep the side of the hill safe. And I look up in the mountains and tell them, you've got to be kidding. That doesn't mean we don't need regulation. We do. We all need regulation. You need regulation at home. You have regulations for your kids, and we have regulations for the people, so we behave. But most people do behave. And I don't like, and I know the folks of Idaho County don't like being treated like ignorant, or ignorant, that they're not going to behave. Sheriff's Department takes care of those that do misbehave. There's an elite few, and I, I shouldn't say environmentalists because I don't call them elite, but 
there's a few, and they have a lot of money, and they want to control, as a quote, the ignorant masses. And if you really look at it, there are a lot of people that really don't know what's going on. And why don't they? Because it's tough to know what's going on. I mean, you guys write the Idaho Code, and I guarantee you don't know what's in it. <laughs> I think I've heard that before. It's tough. And the Forest Service, they have a, their own book, and I don't even know what's in it. Every time I go to the forest, I know I'm doing something wrong. And if you read the book, you'll find out you are. Like, can you cut wood out of a slash pile? Yes, you can. But you can also get a ticket for it, so it just depends. It's very insulting and demeaning when the federal lawmakers, rule makers, regulation makers, make these rules and regulations, and we have to abide by them, and we don't even know what for, given some, I don't know what you would call it, uh, I just say reason. It's given a reason. If you believe it, most people try to believe. We trust. I was raised to trust. Through school, you're raised to, to trust and believe what you're taught. I guess the problem is there is I went to Cal Poly, and uh, they're teaching something different over at Berkeley. It's kind of becoming not the system that I was raised under. It's not the governing system that I think that our constitutional republic allows us to have. You don't want me making rules for you. Because if you do, then I'm going to make the rules from where I stand politically and every other way. And if you don't believe in what I believe in and I make rules against you, you want to have some say. Call the government. I have his number right here. Call the EPA. Who are you going to talk to? You're going to talk to somebody that has no clue what you're talking about, unless it affects them directly. These situations, in my opinion, are escalating, and they are intensifying. And it's my job to represent the people, and I hope that you will take what I've said and what the other gentlemen have said and utilize it in your thinking when you make your decisions regarding such things as water, forest, and uh, the citizens, because that's who we represent. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming. Our last one is... Uh, uh, I've written on the program is Jim Smellick. Not here. Oh, take it back. I didn't see him either. I, I must be a till just, he was in the back row. <laughs> he snuck in. Jim, if you can get done in a few minutes, we'll have we have four other people sign up that would give a couple of minutes each if we get done quick enough. So do what you need to do and I'll do my best. Uh, tell Chairman us your Pierce, name and who you represent. Chairman Denny. Uh, I represent the people in this room the citizens of Idaho County. I'd first like to thank the committee for taking time to listen to the good people of this room through us. And I want you to take a good look around this room, because this is Idaho, right here, what you're looking at. These citizens here today, it's not Jonathan Oppenheimer in the Idaho Conservation League. It's not the Wilderness Society. It's not the Nature Conservancy. It's not Rivers United for Idaho. It's not Friends of the Clearwater, who propose radical ideas that are destroying our forest and our way of life in this country. You know, this country, we hear about it, it's founded in the rule of law. I'd like to give you a little different perspective. I don't know if I can really add anything to what was added here. Everybody's done a great job. But I really don't think we were established under the rule of law. We were understand the rule of the natural law. And I think we've forgotten that. That natural law was placed in our Declaration of Independence and then codified a law in the Constitution of the United States to protect the rights of these individuals in this room, the individuals on this committee, and the individual of every American in this country. Today, I think we've forgotten that. Now, I'll give you some examples of when we've broken the law in this country. When 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence, they committed high treason, punishable by death. Dred Scott took our Constitution and took a look at it and said, I am a whole man, I'm not three-fifths of a man. You know, we got that part wrong in our Constitution. During the World War II, we interned Americans, and we took their property from them, and we never gave it back. And we did that under the precedence of law and the rule, and the Supreme Court agreed with an executive order in this country. And in 1955, Rosa Parks refused to go to the back of the bus, and she broke the law. Gentlemen, it's not the rule of law we need to be concerned about. It's, the, it's those foundations in our principles of what we have in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. 
The EPA today rules by the rule of rule, I would call it. It's not a law. They make these things up as they go along. And I believe, Joe, right? Tom. Tom said it best. They're jack-booted jack thugs. They operate through intimidation and fear. It's not the way our government should operate. It's not the way our government was set up to operate. Let's take a look at the economic impacts. We, we always talk about in Idaho. I've been reviewing economic impacts in this state for quite a while because the economics are not that great. Our median income has fallen from $60,000 to $56,000 a year. We've added between, well, from 89,000 to 214,000 people on the food stamp rolls in this state. Okay, we are 45th in GDP. Yet the, recrea yet the environmental community, what I call the radical environmental community, because I think you have the real environmental community sitting in this room here, the people who really <coughs> care, but the radical environmental community tells us about the recreational economy that we're supposed to have. But at every turn, we see that economy destroyed. We're suing in Idaho County over the Clearwater Forest Management Plan because they've kicked the snowmobilers off the forest. Who headed up those lawsuits? Friends of the Clearwater. Snowmobiles don't leave a footprint, guys, just like these dredgers don't leave a footprint in the river. As a matter of fact, I've seen videotape of the dredgers with the fish in behind them, just having a heyday feeding on what's there. We need to get back to protecting the rights of the people in this room. We all took an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. I take that oath very seriously as well as I believe you do. My intention is not to accuse any of you of not taking that oath seriously. I believe you do. But I think sometimes we need to refresh a little bit of our past and take a look at what it is to move forward in the future. I can give you a few little stats real quick about in Idaho County, what environmental policies have done to our county when 246,000 acres burned. I believe this committee has heard, heard me say this before, but I believe it's worth repeating. That equated out to 1.23 billion board feet of timber burned to the ground. At $300 a thousand, that was $369 million in the resource lost to our county. That could have, if we would have had the 25% fund, could have provided $92,500,000 to build new schools, fund education, fund our local road districts and our county road department and our county government. And we don't have it anymore. The multiplier in the economy of $369 million, $369 million is five to seven in the timber, timber industry. Multiply that by just three, and that's a billion dollars in lost jobs and economic activity. These good people here took off today from their jobs. We don't, they, 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 we're not, these people in this room aren't wealthy. They're not rich, but they care. They care more than any environmental organization that I've ever seen. They understand we need to take care and preserve this for the next hundred years. And they're just trying to make a living, some of them. Some of them are just trying to recreate. What this has done to our economy is people who can't come into our county now because they're afraid to come in. Okay, they use our hotels, they buy our gas, they, buy, they go to our grocery stores. They even buy some local things at the local um, you know, pharmacies and things like that. These impacts are huge when you start multiplying them out. If we're going to increase the value in Idaho for Idahoans, it's going to be through the utilization of our natural resources. And these people in this room, every single one of them, has just as much right to go in and dredge these rivers, has the boaters do the fish on them, has the rafters do to go raft, as I do to go swimming in with my children, as we do. That's what this is about. It's about our freedom and it's about our liberty. We need to stand for that. I don't know if I can say anything else. I think it was all, it was all said here. I don't know if I really added too much to it. The sheriff did a great job. Joe, Tom did a great job. And I, I'll let these other good people talk. Okay, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, let me give some names, and, and, and you know, if we get through them, we'll even... Can we, any of you have burning questions for those four initially? Must have been one burning question. <laughs> okay. Mr. Speaker, or Go Mr. Ahead. Chairman, can whoever... Any of you, thank you for your testimony, it was great. Can you explain why the EPA has not got involved in Montana's dredging permit and why they haven't imposed themselves on Montana when they did on Idaho? Because it seems to me that if we had imposed a little bit stronger state policies from the get-go, the EPA wouldn't have come in 
And so it tends to fall on our shoulders. I don't know that anyone has that answer of why they haven't, but I do know that they take authority. And if you give it to them, it's theirs. When you don't allow certain authorities, they back away because they don't want to fight with us. I don't want to fight with them. But that would be my guess. If you say, hands off, back up, or you're going to spend time where you don't want to spend time, they back off and then they reassess what authority they really have or where do they really get it or do they, in fact, really have the authority to do what they're doing because they just keep taking a little bit at a time, that drip, drip thing. So I would guess that's why. If we stand up, they'll back away. You have to turn on at the bottom. There's a, there's a switch Pierce. at the bottom. Uh, I do understand that state of California is not under the NPDS. And, you know, they do have a big hammer with all their money. I do not know why. But it's as he said, I think if you stand up to them, they do reevaluate. Re Mr. Smellick? Chairman Pierce, Chairman Denny, Representative Purpleding. <laughs> There's also, there was also an interesting case uh, decided in, uh, in Montana that declared the riverbeds and the water, which is what they are in this state, in every state, we own the water and we own the riverbeds. And that was uh, uh, set by precedents in, uh, in the Supreme Court. That may be one reason why the EPA has not moved in there. But where the, where, where the EPA has moved in, though, if you'll take a look, is Oklahoma has written legislation and Wyoming has written legislation on issues concerning the EPA. You know, they just they just took basically uh, took over the, the management of a city through the through the tribes, and the EPA did this through edict. There was no law involved with this. It was a rulemaking decision, and the and Wyoming is very very upset by this, and they drafted legislation to uh, say you can't do this. I think we need to follow the same thing. That was something else somebody asked me to read here. This committee should seriously look at at legislation similar to what's in Wyoming, and Oklahoma, to take on the EPA. So I hope that helps you with the question. Like I said, in Montana, that's where that case was decided. So maybe that has something to do with the EPA not being so heavy-handed in the state of Montana. Okay, thank you. We have um, Brad Bristol. Brad, if you'll be short, we'll get one or two more in here before we're out of time. So take the mic and tell us your name and who you represent. Welcome to the committee. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Brad Bristol. I represent myself. I'm a small section judge minor. I um, have a couple of claims in Idaho County. Um, first thing I want to say is that uh, in a meeting that we had with the GPAA, Nampa GPA, and the EPA, I was told by an EPA uh, representative that I was a criminal and had been a criminal since 1972 for, mining, for dredge mining. And I was uh, minding all the Idaho laws, all the permits, everything. This is what I was told. I have a whole room full of witnesses that were all there and heard it at the same time. The other thing is, is that we had a miner whose claim has been uh, denied for dredging because of uh, mercury contamination. Uh, when he inquired on how to, if he could clean, get a permit to clean his own claim, um, he was told no. That's not what they do. Um, also like to point out, I'm a fourth generation Idahoan. My family was here before this was a state. I love this country. I love this state. I love the environment. Miners clean up more garbage on those creeks and rivers than those pictures could possibly show you. Lead, piles of lead, mercury, garbage, by the ton we pull out of there. And nobody ever gives us credit for that. There's no signs up there in the creek, oh, this is cleaned by such and such miner. There's no, client, no signs like that, but we do it. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Ron Hancock. All right. Thank you very much. That's kind of you. Roger Jorstad. And after Roger will be John Stickley. Well, they told me I had three minutes and I got two hours, but uh, I thank you very much. Because <laughs> uh, I did a lot of reading. And I want to shake this man's hand, the sheriff, right? Right. Thank you. Sure. So anyway, uh, I'm Roger Jorstead, a drafted Vietnam veteran. I live in Caldwell, and I uh, want a little tiny dredge. I got $10,000 of junk and stuff, and I got $1,000 worth of gold. Uh, I want to answer, I think, I had a different deal, but I, 
after listening to this, I think I want to enlighten you a little bit how the EPA is doing this. Go to your Google and put in the words, sue and settle. You'll get 2,200,000 hits. Uh, sue and settle is big business for the EPA. Here's one of the, the first, I only read the first 10. This is a 12 state sue, EPA over agencies allege sue and settle tactics. Uh, it'll scare you. Uh, this here article here talks about how the, the Idaho Conservation League, one of the greenies, put the pressure through uh, going to sue the EPA, and that's what got this dredge thing going on here, uh, the permit thing going on here in Idaho. Here's a report done by you guys in 2003 on the Clearwater River, which says all these guys here, it says there's no, it just says there's no, nothing wrong with the dredges. It doesn't harm the creek at all. This is done on the South Fork of the Clearwater River on a one-day deal and 10 days at three different locations, three different size dredges. Uh, here is a, uh, very quickly, here is a 2009 uh, State of Idaho dredging application and rules right there. You could go to the, it's over by the Copper Kitchen now, you could walk in there, get this, give them your $10, and you could go dredging tonight. You can't do that now on the 44-page application, which I got a thing of it here. Here it is, 44 pages you got to fill out. Some of it is rules, you got to fill out. And then your chances of getting that application are about nil. There was 911 of these issued last year, and 61 were approved by the EPA. The EPA is not there to make it 100 approved next year. They're there to make it 50 next year. They're not there to make it 200. That's all taxes for you, by the way. The, the EPA is doing this permit thing. They want to get it down to where, see, they can't say no dredging because that will that might inflict the Second Amendment. So they just say, well, if you fill out 44 pages and go by all these rules, then uh, uh, I'm going to say about 2008, I went to a meeting at the Big Shot from uh, Seattle come over, and this was their thing, and it was about uh, uh, stream channel alteration. And you talk about jet boats and stuff. And so after they were talking, I raised my hand kind of like this again, and I says, so I says, uh, an outfitter up here in the mountains whose dad did it and his grandpa did it, and he's been traveling that train sail, and you know how it, that trail, how you go back in the canyon and come out, and back in all those canyons, that little tiny creek that your horse walks over that's that wide. I says, and the horse steps in that creek. Did that horse alter the stream? And he said, yes. He needs a permit to do that. So then I asked him, I asked him, I says, so the jet boater on the Salmon River that pulls his boat up and parks the bow of the boat on the river, did he alter the stream? Yes, he altered the stream. So through all this stuff, I don't know if you know this, I brought the bucket of pollutants by the EPA. I went down to the Boise River in Caldwell, took my shovel, stuck it in the water and pulled it out. Now it's a pollutant. I put it in a bucket. I altered the streets and I took pollutants. In all reality, like he was saying, the fines are $10,000 a day for each of those. Are you gonna arrest me? No, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I go back to this deal on, <clears throat> if you look at that there and you say, hey, I wanna take my grandson legally this weekend to go dredging, you can't do it. That freedom has been taken away from you. And just two years ago, you could go get a permit done by the Idaho Department of Water Resources a one-page one permit, $10, buy a dredge from uh, finders keepers, and this weekend you could have went dredging by going by these rules. We need Roger, to do that again. We're out of time. Thank yeah. you. <clears throat> John, uh, you going to you be short? We're... <laughs> well, we'll, we'll, give, we'll give you a minute. <laughs> My name is John Stickley, and I represent everybody in this meeting here. And uh, I also said, or I also heard that Doug said that he didn't uh, have any EPA that he, uh, to his knowledge, in his county this year. Well, that's a mistake. Uh, on August 11th, let me read this to you. This is from the Environmental Protection Agency, Region 10, out of Seattle. 
I have four federal mining claims on the South Fork of the Clearwater River in uh, Elk City Mining District, which is rich in gold, and that's why I go there. That's why I own the claims to go in there and get that gold. Now I have people telling me that I can't go in there, and I've been dredging in that river for quite a while. And uh, like I said, he said earlier, you know, it's one door to go in and one door to go out. Real easy to get a, a permit from the Department of Water Resources to do our jobs. Okay, now when the EPA steps in, uh, all hell broke loose. And it's time for a change. On August 11th, 2013, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency uh, inspected your dredge site operation on the South Fork of the Clearwater River, approximately uh, eight miles from Elk City. And it says, determine its compliance with their uh, Clean Water Act, the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System. At the time of the inspection, the inspectors noted that you were not operating your dredge, which I was not. I was just going to work to operate my dredge. He goes, well, the enforcement uh, officer from Region 10, he told me that I was lucky that my dredge was not running. You know what I told him? I said, well, I'll go down there and run it for you. And he said, well, he just kind of looked at me. And I asked him, I said, what are you doing here? Are you going to find me? I want a citation, and I want it now. Well, at the time I inspect, and the inspectors noticed that I was not operating my dredge, when asked if I had the MPDES permit for my operations, I had stated that I had the Department of Water Resource permit. Okay, that's all I've been using for years to mine on my federal mining claims. One door to go in, one door to go out, real easy. I've also had Mr. Paul Shepard visit me on my mining claims on the South Fork of the Clearwater and seeing the material and the gold that we're getting out of there. And it was, I'm really happy to have him come down there and represent you guys to come down and visit my claims and my rights in America. One more quick thing here. They were talking about fines. He told me that uh, the lucky, I wasn't, you know, lucky that my dredge wasn't running because I was going to get a $50,000 fine, $37,500 per day violation on this issue. And to boot, three years in federal prison. So I basically laughed at him. I said, so you're going to tell me that you're going to take 30 days away of my income from me? He hands me a small business application. I laughed at him and I about threw it down at his feet. I said, come on, get real. Well, We've had enough of the EPA trying to uh, come in and, and take away our rights as we the people. It's us. Look at the people here. We're all miners. We like to do what we like to do. I have 30 days to mine on my claims. On the third day of the season, the EPA drove by on the road. Didn't stop, didn't say hi, kiss my ass or nothing. So anyway, what I'm doing is... Uh, you know, I take off my white belt, and I hear I'm waiting for the EPA to come back and arrest me. 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I put my white belt on, I'm back to work. 27 days later, at 11.30 on August 11th, they show up. 27 days into my season. So I asked the guy, what are you doing here? 27 days later, I says, I could have swore I seen you guys driving down the road. He goes, yeah, we were just doing a drive-by. <laughs> we were just looking to see who was there. Well... The 50 miles of the uh, South Fork of the Clearwater River, there's three or four dredgers <coughs> on that whole 50-mile stretch. We are not doing any damage to that river or anywhere else. I don't even throw out a gum wrapper. We pick up trash. I picked up over, I, I dredged over 20 pounds of fisherman's lead. I am a fisherman. I have nothing against a fisherman. We pulled out over 20 pounds of lead probably in about 10 days of dredging on our sites. We're cleaning the river systems, period. And... Uh, <coughs> I also stopped by Mr. Smellick's house on the way to my dredging operation prior to the season. I pulled up in his driveway in my motorhome. I do bring money to the state of Idaho. I am a non-resident. I pay 30 days, $30 for a non-resident permit. I am from Eastern Washington, and I love the state of Idaho. It's beautiful, especially in Idaho County where Doug's from. He's right. There's water everywhere. There's wildlife everywhere. But us little dredgers, small-scale dredgers, we are criminals in their eyes, and we've had enough of it. So we're going to be here today and stand up for our rights, and hopefully you guys can understand what we're going through and get on our side. Thank you, John. Thank you. Chairman Denny, do you have anything you'd like to add?
Thank you, Senator Pierce. I too want to uh, thank all of you for coming and uh, today and and giving us educating us on what's going on out there. We appreciate that. Any of you who didn't get an opportunity to testify, uh, if you would bring your written testimony forward and set it up here, our secretaries will get that and make sure that everyone has a copy of that in their packets as well. Thank you. Senators, we're going to go in and take care of a couple of several printings we have, and so we'll, uh, we'll start in about three or four minutes in our committee. And folks, thank you very much, and we're sorry we didn't have more time today. Thank you. Idaho in Session is sponsored by Don't Fail Idaho, the Idaho State Broadcasters Association, Union Pacific Foundation, the Idaho Association of Counties, the Association of Idaho Cities, the Idaho Cable Telecommunications Association, and your contributions to the Idaho Public Television Endowment, with additional support provided by the Idaho School Board Association,